Hello. Uh, so in our last lecture of the computer graphics class today, uh, we will discuss shadows and curves, two separate topics, but I will wrap them up in one uh, session. Uh, and that would be the last video of this playlist. Uh, so I will begin with the shadows, shadow generation in forward rendering. Uh, we are already familiar familiar with shadow generation in backward rendering, aka uh, the ray tracing. Uh, it would be natural if the ray, um, the shadow ray doesn't hit the uh, light source, then it that pixel would basically be under shadow. It is very natural. It is very simple to implement shadows in backward rendering, but we may not go with backward rendering. We may use forward rendering, the projection-based stuff, which is more natural to the human eye. And in that scenario, shadow generation is more trickier. And we will discuss that. First, I will show you the importance of shadows. Uh, essentially, they provide realism to the scenes, as one can see from here. Uh, it gives some cues about light positions so here there is no shadow but here because of the placement of the shadow i can decide that the light is somewhere here on the left of this building uh, in addition to the light position i can also uh, infer object position here if you look at top and bottom you can see that the ones at the top are touching the floor due to the uh, relationship between the object and its shadow. And here, actually, they are placed the same relatively, but uh, apparently they are going from low location to high location. And we can decide that using shadows. Without shadow, you cannot separate this, uh, distinguish this image from the top image. Uh, and uh, in some semesters, uh, this, all, this homework is given like to put shadows uh, to the ray traced images. So here again, we can see the importance of shadows to bring more realism to this basic scene. Shadow version is better. And shadows are not only supposed to go to ground, it can go to the object itself, self shadow or it can cast shadow to other places, other objects. So they, they will all be uh, discussed. So in forward rendering, we essentially talk about some graphics libraries that provide us the projection matrices, the transformation matrices in general. And the most common API for that would be OpenGL, which doesn't support shadow generation by default. I mean, there is no GL make shadow comment function. Similarly, no support in direct 3D either. Uh, but the uh, subroutines in OpenGL or D3D uh, provides us means to uh, generate our own shadows in the forward rendering pipeline. And to that effect, we will use some buffers actually. Uh, and uh, we will see two different methods shadow volumes and shadow mapping and uh, there will be trade-offs uh, which one to choose uh, there is no definite answer either they come with both advantages and disadvantages uh, this is still an active research area uh, so in this paper which is not so recent actually but still it is some 2000 paper compared to the 1977 origin of this shadow volume um, they improve the shadow volume uh, furthermore. Uh, so let's see shadow volumes then. The idea is to create a 3D shape uh, to, to create a 3D shape that represents the shadow that is casted by an object. So effectively you are creating the shadow hull, uh, like the visual hull 
this is a, 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 like view for us. So there is a volume that is uh, generated by the shadow. Uh, so that volume, everything in that volume will be under shadow effectively. So our task is to generate this volume, which is a weird shape. So I couldn't tell you a simple name for that. Like that, it won't be a cube. It can be an arbitrary polyhedron. Uh, uh, but the construction mechanism is uh, very sound. Uh, so the way we do this is we first detect the contour edges, or, uh, aka silhouette edges. These are the ones that uh, uh, that are coming from two polygons. Remember, every edge is incident to two polygons in our polygon mesh. Uh, unless it's a border edge, but uh, let's consider the general scenario. If you have two faces touching to that edge and one of those faces are facing the light source and the other way, the other one is not facing the light source, then it means that you are at the contour. So it would be uh, an interesting edge for me from which I will create my shadow volume. So let's see this in this picture for instance if light is here uh, you will have this vector from light to a point in the polygon so when i am processing uh, this edge for instance this edge okay this red edge here i will look at two polygons attached to it one two uh, and I will select a point on the polygon. Mostly, typically, it is in the center of the polygon. So I will create this vector from light to the to that point, uh, like, and the dot product between this normal and this vector. Let me zoom it in here. This is the normal. This is the vector. As you can see, the dot product would be negative. It is the scalar projection of this vector on this unit direction. When it is negative, it means that this is a front facing, okay, front face F. And when it is positive, which happens in this case, so let's uh, generate this ray from light to this center point, and let's make it larger. Uh, and then you have this uh, vector uh, and scalar projection of this on to this unit direction, unit normal, is this thing. I don't really care about the amount of the projection. I just see that it is uh, matching to the, the directions. So this is positive. And positive dot product tells that you have a back facing polygon. If you have a, a combination of front and back um, in the two faces that you are dealing with, then this is a contour. Okay, so this is marked as contour edge. And with this tactic, you process all the edges uh, in a for loop and each edge brings you, you two faces, two polygons, and you decide the labels of them, front or back. If you have an FB or BF situation, then you have, uh, you label that edge as the contour edge. And here is the pseudocode for that. Uh, you create your, light direction and but first of all the light ray is known as light position in the pseudocode you first transform that light to the coordinate system of the object uh, because the normal of the object is living in that space so you bring everything to the same space uh, and once you do that uh, now you have a light direction uh, the positive dot product, remember, it is about back facing. Then uh, then uh, you uh, do this test for every edge of the polygon. Uh, so this loop doesn't really go through the edges. It goes through polygons. Uh, so this is just an implementation difference. But still, this also works. Uh, for a polygon, you will consider three edges. So when you consider this edge, uh, first you may put it to the contour edge list. 
later and maybe this is back later when you process this edge again due to a, a different polygon uh, and it is already in the you have a still a positive dot product so this is still back and this edge is still is already in the contour list then you remove it because you uh, it can't be a contour edge since it is referenced by two triangles that are back facing facing away from the light so you remove it like this loop also works but a simpler way is just go through a loop over edges and uh, do separate tests uh, and look for the FB situation to add it to the contour list. At any rate, uh, when you apply this tactic, you will have this set of contour edges. And once the contours are found, we need to, the second step comes now, we need to extrude the contours to create a large volume that we call shadow volume. Um, so how to do that? Actually, this is the visual output. So I have this one, two, three, four contour edges. And actually I define these vectors to the endpoints of these edges. And I uh, move them a little bit further. This is the offset. Uh, so it's a parameter. So you move them. Uh, in the same direction uh, with the offset amount uh, and you can also cap the bottom to create a closed volume but this is optional uh, in the end you have this environment now let's look how they, they look in real world uh, data here is the light source as you can see white point um, th these are this is the shadow volume uh, and looking at a different configuration, we have this shadow volume. Now what, you may ask. So, okay, uh, I have the shadow volume. Uh, I have the contour edges. I extruded them and I get my volume. Now, how can we proceed? Uh, we can assume that array or, uh, originates from the eye or camera. Uh, so if it enters, the shadow volume from a front face. So remember, this is the shadow volume. Uh, again, I can't control this smoothly. Uh, okay, pen. So in this scenario, let me put the shadow volume in red. This is the shadow area in 2D, obviously, but anyway. So this is a front face. Normal is this. So you are entering the shadow volume from a front face and then exiting from a back face because this part is the back and this part is the front. So you exit. So you entered and exited. Then the point you reach in the end of this travel will not be under shadow because you already exited the uh, dangerous area. However, if it does not exit before hitting the object, which happens in this bottom ray, so enter from front and before exit from back, I have a hit. So this hit is under shadow. No matter what its color is, I, I will uh, render it uh, unless there is some blending is happening. I will render it in black in shadow. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, the idea. Uh, but the problem with that idea is what is the ray? I don't have any ray. I am not doing ray tracing at all. So I can't really create this ray uh, trivially in the forward rendering. Uh, so to that end, we use stencil buffers. Remember, uh, stencil buffer is this mask that allows you to render uh, some parts defined by that mask. Uh, and it can be an arbitrary mask. So then you design your stencil buffer with respect to your uh, shadow volume and that region uh, given by the stencil buffer as uh, uncolorable, unrenderable will not be rendered. So we are effectively going to use the stencil buffer. You can look in our previous set of slides and video to see the some example stencil buffers. Uh, here, 
we emphasized that uh, in that class last week, stencil buffer can be arbitrarily shaped. And this fits well here because our shadow volume can be arbitrarily shaped. Hence, we can use that. Uh, and the technical details is not algorithmic, so I will skip it, but you will use some open GL calls to enable and disable your stencil buffer uh, and make the, uh, the wall shadowing happen. <clears throat> so shadow volume are uh, seen in shadow volume algorithm is seen in many applications and some of them are very famous like doom 3 video game and they use this algorithm in this game to get these uh, shadows uh, and as far as the pros and cons go uh, i can say that this pre-processing uh, I need to do it for all edges in my scene. So uh, some action to take uh, care in the beginning. Uh, and also all those volumes, they depend on the light. If I move the light a little bit, I have to recompute all that preprocessing all over again. So this is not efficient. Uh, however, not that it those rays they don't really depend on uh, the camera. I don't use any camera ray. I just use light rays. So it means that if you use your camera, it is still efficient to do shadow volume. Uh, and another disadvantage maybe if your mesh is not manifold, like it has non-manifold edges and it is uh, incident to three or more faces uh, which is an undefined scenario because in a manifold mesh two manifold mesh embedded in 3d every edge is incident to two fa faces and if it can be incident to one face if it's the border which is okay but if the mesh is not manifold then it will there will be three faces then how you will do your labeling then there will be fbb or fbf or BBB, BBB, FFF, the, those combinations that are just undefined, you uh, make arbitrary choices. Furthermore, there may be holes, which are still manifold, but still holes. So your shadow volume may be uh, not that solid in the end. If you are dealing with an inaccurate mesh, then you will see bad shadows. Mm. And a, a common trick for speed up is uh, you keep a low resolution version of the object and create your shadow volume, decide your contour edges on this uh, version. Uh, and then you define your shadow volume. And then when it comes to rendering, uh, you display your actual high resolution model and the shadow of it will be decided by these low resolution contour edges which works pretty well because shadows are, uh, uh, there won't be any detail in the shadows anyway. They will be just black, so it can tolerate a little bit low resolution generation here. Uh, okay, let's see the second algorithm then, shadow mapping. Uh, uh, in which I will uh, do this trick. The trick is, I will render the scene from the point of view of the light source. So this is very smart and very cool, actually. Uh, normally, I render the scene from the point of view of the camera, of the eye, because it is uh, the natural way to go. Now, I will move the... Uh, I will use the light source as the camera uh, temporarily, and I will get a picture uh, so I will fill my depth buffer from that orientation of the temporary camera. And then whatever I see will, will touch light. So it won't be under shadow. But whatever I don't see, remember, I can do that with depth buffer tests easily. So for the same pixel, I will have values from 0 to 1, 1 being very far away from the camera, zero being very close to the camera, 
So for the same pixel, if I have 0 0.5 and 0 0.7, then I will use the pixel color that is associated with 0 0.5, right? So once you have that, that buffer from the point of view of the light uh, source, then you can do your regular Z, Z buffer algorithm or that buffer algorithm, same thing. Uh, and it will be the end of it. So the very smart, very basic idea and it just works. Uh, so pretend that there is a camera at the light position. So this is the original camera view. Uh, and from here, I can see that light is somewhere here. Now put the camera here, so it will look, it will see this part, the unseen part of this object. If you look at this image, this is the uh, new temporary camera at the position of light source. And it gives you this uh, view, right? So if you look at the depth buffer of this, uh, everything here will be uh, small values because it is closer to the camera. So I will all render them. Uh, and for instance, assume that in the original scenario, there is some apple here, okay? Uh, or apple is very weird here, but maybe a car here. Then this car will be in the back of this, okay? So for the same pixel, the car pixel will have a higher depth buffer value compared to the building pixel. So uh, it will be, uh, higher here it won't be seen so when you come back to the original view you will just put a black pixel here instead of the car color pixel and that's that actually for shadow mapping uh, and we see that in other games uh, so they alternate shadow volume and shadow map uh, in video games we see them uh, in uh, alternation uh, yeah so these are some games and that finishes our shadow business uh, and now i am ready and hopefully you are also uh, ready to discuss the second part uh, which would be curves a more mathematical part uh, that has nothing to do with shadows, actually. Uh, so we will do curves now. And for the curves, again, for the last time, uh, I am Yusuf Sahil Lola, and I get these slides from my colleague Oğuz Akyus. Uh, and I also update them, uh, mostly, but still the base uh, belongs to Oğuz. Uh, yeah, so for the curves, this is a, an objective presentation. So we are familiar with polygon mesh representation of surfaces, uh, but this is not the only way to go with. I can have a surface made up by uh, surface patches, where each patch is a uh, spline. Uh, and in 2D, I will have uh, curves instead of surfaces. So I will have a set of curves, which we also co call spline curve. A spline curve means uh, continuous curve segments that are continuous means they are, they are connected, uh, they are continuous, and uh, there will be a level of connectivity, C0, C1, C2, so there, there can be very smooth connections. We prefer smooth connections actually. And supply surface is similar, a set of two supply curves matched on a smooth surface. We will see surfaces later on. Uh, so when we discuss curves, we generally talk about some control points that guide the curves, the red guys here. And the curve is interpolating if it passes through those control points and the curve is approximating if it passes around those control points. So depending on your application, you may want one or the other. Uh, so we will actually see today examples for interpolated curves as well as approximated curves. This one being the Bezier curves actually. And this, I will talk about some cubic supplies here. Uh, 
So the motivation of uh, curve generation is that you evaluate an expensive function that takes a lot of time only at some fixed few amount of landmark points, the red points. Then you fit a supply uh, to those points and then you can get that value interpolated over that supply as you can now go through that supply by changing one parameter like time parameter just like you use that to go over lines uh, you can have a, a, a sub, um, parameter that lets you travel over the supply and you can apply that parameter to the function values uh, defined predefined few function values to get the function values at any place uh, okay so here are the ways to connect two curves c0 means they are just connected but i don't really care about their smoothness c0 means we have the same tangents at the connection point so c1 uh, c1 connectivity this is c2 uh, in addition to the tangent uh, lines we also preserve the change in rate of change the second derivative so the Polyline is a linear approximation to curve. You just, uh, that would be the green thing here. You, you just connect the few control points using lines. Um, so it won't make good uh, interpolations for you. Uh, we generally want uh, a curve fitted to this control points. And this subline here it consists of one two three four five six seven curves uh, and now we will uh, see how to connect them smoothly among the representations we discussed so far curves fit into this parametric representation once you have your curve you can travel over it using some time parameter uh, and now let's see some uh, curves actually. I will talk about supplies, a set of curves, and I will show you how to connect them smoothly. Uh, to that end, we will use cubic supplies. To define a cubic supply, I need four control points. Uh, 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 I need four parameters. So, cubic means the parameter u uh, that defines the curve, uh, it goes as high as to the power of three uh, so this makes it cubic you will see u cube here and uh, you will also have u square and u and u to the power of zero which is one and all those four terms they come with some coefficients i will use some amount of those uh, u powers and those coefficients b1 b2 b3 and b4 uh, are the ones that i need to compute actually uh, once i uh, know them i can travel over this curve by just changing the u value so what are the b1 b2 b3 and b4 then actually the way the way i find them uh, i will just investigate them separately for x coordinate y coordinate and z coordinate so you can run three different independent threads for them or just do it sequentially, but you will just analyze them separately. So we will focus on the X coordinate, not only, but it is the same as the other components. Again, PU is this, and I will use uh, the tangent, the derivative of uh, the cubic supply at that U point. So I need the derivative of this PU function which gives me this i need to remember this so my input is i will use two points p1 and p2 and user also gives me the tangents at those endpoints p1 prime and p2 prime so i will obey these four uh, requests and i will as essentially fill put this black curve between p1 and p2 in this shape uh, dictated by this tangents so how to do that 
First of all, I want to be at P1 when U is zero, and I want to be at P2 when U is uh, one. So U1 will control this curve only. U2 will control a second curve. So it is not involved now. Don't worry about U2. I will just use U1. So when U1 is zero, P0 should return me. Remember, zero is about U. U is about zero. Uh, P0 should return me P1, okay? And also another input is P1 prime, the tangent, which is the first derivative. Uh, so it must be equal to P1 prime. So this is given as well as this is given. Similarly, when you put uh, U2 to your P function, uh, it will bring you to this location p p p2 uh, and similarly its derivative should be p prime 2 so now let's do the substitutions actually we already seen that p0 is p1 and when you plug 0 to our actual generic equation everything goes away but b1 so this says that actually this is already known. B1 is known. Remember, my aim is to uh, find B1, B2, B3, and B4. Similarly, B2 is already known because if you use the derivative version of this PU and plug zero here, you will get B2, uh, which is equal to P1 bar. Everything is known because I know P1 prime. What are the other cases? When you plug U2 here, all the use becomes u2 uh, and you have to land to p2 location okay and you have to land to p2 prime location in terms of derivatives this is for the tangent so i just basically rewrite this and pull down p3 from b b3 from here and this is the b4 so see i know now b1 b2 b3 and b4 all in terms of the given values p's p bars p primes as well as the current u values now let's extend this so this is the tricky part because i don't just want to do this for one curve i will have set of curves that are connected in a c1 way so the tangent uh, tangents at the connection point must match from the left curve the tangent will be this and from the right the tangent will be this so i will solve the system from left and right and i will get this tangent value so user doesn't provide this orange tangent value it is impractical he or she cannot know this all he or she knows is i want this orange thing to be the same if i compute it with respect to this left curve or this right curve okay that is the idea so how to do that actually? Uh, I want uh, actually I, I want further than C1 connectivity. I want C2 connectivity uh, for further smoothness. So the second derivative, not the first derivative, at uh, this point uh, will be uh, uh, will be this. Uh, when you use p1 and p2 uh, so again to come here i need to use u2 and i will also get this value using this curve from p2 to p3 and now i will not use u2 i will use zero because this is the zero parameter with respect to this curve the second curve and this point is u3 parameter right so i will set this use zero parameter and the output will be again whatever it is so this is by the way the second derivative of our p function if you recall your p uh, function when you take the first derivative it will be this when you take the second derivative it will be like six times b for u and two times b3 right and this goes away six times b for u2 and two times b3 uh, and I just, instead of U, I put U2. This is, again, uh, generated using this left curve. 
So it uses P1 and P2 endpoints with U2 parameter. And then the same function, the second derivative, now instead of U2, I will plug zero instead of U. Uh, then this goes away. I just end up with 2B3. Uh, and th that's it actually, 2B3. And this thing must be equal to this thing. So 2B3 plus 6B4 U2 must be equal to 2B3. Okay, this thing is equal to this thing. But you just can't cancel out 2B3, although they look identical, they are not, be careful. Uh, because the B3 you generate here, it is found using P1 and P2 points only, just like I did in the very beginning, like here, P1 and P2. Because uh, I have only P1 and P2 in the left curve. I don't know anything about P3. So the B3 is actually different than the B3 I am going to use here. The B3 I am going to use here, I will use the same equation. P something minus P something over U something to the square. And C is the same pattern, but the difference is the U parameter is different here because I am now using U3, which is uh, attached to this second right curve. Uh, and I am now using P2 and P3 points, P2 point and P3 point. Um, so it is different than P1 and P2 points. That's why the B3 I will have here will have a different scalar value than the B3 I have here. That's why I cannot just simply cancel this and this. I just put these correct uh, parameters here and then I solve for them. Uh, I rewrite this thing here, uh, and in the end, I have this system, the uh, unknown, uh, remember the endpoints are known, only unknown is this P2 prime, the tangent, the orange thing, uh, and it is computed here for me. User doesn't have to provide this, which would be impractical, remember? So here I can solve for B2 prime. P2, P2 prime. Uh, compute the only unknown P2 prime. Uh, and given P2 prime, I, I need this to find my B, B set, the set of four B points uh, with which I can generate points. Because remember, all the goal is to know these B points. Because remember the very first equation for P. Once you know all your B1, B2, B3, B4, you can now go to any point in 2D uh, or in 3D, whatever. Uh, you do it for X coordinate and Y coordinate and Z coordinate separately. So once you know all your B, B1, B2, B3, B4, given the current view, it will pop you out. It, it will give you out a scalar value to be used as your uh, location as your uh, uh, as your x coordinate or y coordinate or z coordinate uh, but again to know b b3 for instance i need this p, p bar to p, p p p prime so derivative so it is not known because user doesn't provide this orange but once i solve uh, this system the only unknown will be Found and I can now define my B1, B2, B3, which will make me move along the first segment. And then I can move along the second segment using the new B1, B2, B3, B4 set of uh, coefficients. And actually the rest is just details. I have driven the unknown orange P2 bar when I have only two curves. But in general, I can support n segments, not only two segments, but n segment, uh, n points. Then I will have n minus one segments. You will just do this uh, for each uh, pair of neighbor curves. Then you will have this set of systems and you will have all this k many, one, two, three, in this case, k is three, k many, uh, tangent uh, vectors, tangent uh, 
vectors and then using them you can find your own b sets for this curve and for this curve and for this curve yeah that's it would be the idea uh and this is just talking about that actually i i, I am skipping here because some layout problems also exist here but the general idea is this and we are running off out of time anyway so i hope that the general idea is clear uh, so you should be at least do this for two curves now you can, should be able to combine two curves some details so the once you have your system set up you have this u parameters parameter which makes you move along the curve so in general we use the centripetal parameterization where the u value depends on the length between two consecutive points if you uh, don't consider this distance then with the uniform parameterization it will make additional uh, journey just to make just to put a lot of u values in this interval but actually if you look at this picture uh, i want more parameterization in this interval as there are a lot of uh, place to cover because there is a lot of distance between p1 and p2 so that would be the chordal uh, parameterization will allow you to do that and we sometimes take the power of the chordal distance then we get this center pedal which again makes more sampling in this huge interval again if you don't do that if you do uh, by the way they are all from the same family okay if you use power of zero then this is equal to one right so with alpha power zero uh, although one two black points they are very close together you make this extra journey which would cause some uh, loops in your curve uh, unpleasantly you will get them uh, so this is the importance of powers in the sampling and that's uh, some applications to use supplies the most common typical application is to model hair strengths as curves uh, so the hairs you see in video games are generally not uh, polygon meshes they are defined by curves and and by the way this was interpolated curve right so all the points i passed through them now bezier curve is a famous alternative in which i have uh, i effectively replace the uh, tangent vector uh, uh, with some control point additional control point uh, so this for instance let's look at this quadratic bezier curve so i need two endpoints the curve will pass through them interpolate them and the third endpoint is just to uh, shape the curve uh, not the endpoint third control point so what you do is when u is something here like zero point or t here i say it t is 0 0.25 you move 0 0.25 in this line from p0 to p1 which brings you to this q0 point similarly you go to this q1 point and then in this line from q0 to q1 you go another 0 0.25 amount which brings you to this black curve point so here in this animation you do this with different t values for instance if you freeze at this moment it will be 60 point 60 and a more famous Bezier curve will be cubic, not quadratic. Then you will have two additional control points plus the two endpoints. Again, it will pass through the endpoints, but not through the control other control points. So we call this approximation curve. Uh, here, again, let's pause it at t equal to 20, 0.25. You go to your Q0 similarly using P0 to P1 line. Then you go to q1 using p1 to p2 line which gives you this r0 if you apply the same 
0.25 displacement. And you do the same from this end, which moves you to R1. And you do a second interpolation on this R0 to R1, again using 0.25 amount. And quart quartic is similar. Now we have five uh, control points, including the endpoints. And, but these are not that popular. Uh, we generally prefer to merge or combine several cubic Bezier curves instead of just making a lot of control points. Uh, yeah. So, and now let's just cut the business. Uh, we have actually, we just get some contribution from some control point. Okay. So, actually, the formulation is this you get J amount from the from this i control point, okay? Uh, so what is this amount j i n that will be applied to the i control point? Uh, we call this blending function, but let me just show you the derivation of it. Actually, this is the formula for this. You n plus i uh, and u to the power of i. Again, i is the i control point. Then there is also one minus i times n minus i. But where does it come from? If you wonder, it comes from that derivation we discussed actually. So if I uh, make a fast forward here, yeah. So this just comes from here, right? Uh, so I want to generate the curve point at this u time, which is like again zero point three maybe. So you first create this p zero one point by moving by again u is here and this is one minus u then so you will get uh, u of p1 and one minus u of p0 the opposite end which brings you to this point p01 similarly you will get u of p2 and one minus u of p1 to get to this p11 and later, now that I have P01 and P11, I do the same. So I will get U of P11 and one minus U of P01. U of P11 and one minus zero of P01, which are already defined in the previous step. So I just replace it. And if you replace it, you will see that you will be hitting one minus U here with this one minus U. So you will have a second degree, U, U square. So that would be your quadrat quadratic Bezier curl. Similarly, if you were doing it for uh, the cubic, then you will have U cube somewhere here. So this is the polynomial of degree two because I am using only three control points. So this is the qu quadratic Bezier curve. Yeah, so that is the Bezier business. You can just define it like that. And you can extend this idea to Bezier surfaces. So the idea is this actually, uh, you have uh, let me just show it here. So these are the control points. Now I want surface over this. What you do is uh, <clears throat> so the control points of the Bezier curve along the U direction, one, five, nine, three. Okay, you will fit a Bezier curve here using the previous algorithm we have seen. Uh, that would be, that would give you this blue control points. Then for a different uh, amount, you will generate the green control points, then the oranges, etc. So as you move in the V direction, you will have all these control points. Uh, and then actually you will have, yeah, so these are those con curves in the, we call it U curve because they go in U direction from left to right. So all, you all have these curves, Bezier curves, and you do a very similar thing now in the V direction. Now this set of points, one, two, three, four, make one Bezier curve, and five, six, seven, eight makes a second V Bezier curve. And you make interpolation from here to here, which gives you these uh, other Bezier curves that are painted 
in this vertical direction from left from bottom to top maybe you can say that and in the end, you will have all these points, right? You will have these quads at your hand, in your hand. One, two, three, four sided quads. And now it is ready to render because you have a quad mesh made up by the U Bezier curves, the horizontal ones, and V Bezier curves, the like diagonal ones. And that is how you define your Bezier surface. And that is how you end the uh, curves and surfaces discussion. Uh, and that is going to be uh, the curve topic. Uh, and we have also extended it to surfaces. But uh, in the end, to summarize very, very quickly, I want you to understand that we discussed today an interpolated curve using cubic supplies and an approximated curve using Bezier curves. Approximate passes and uh, not passes, uh, goes around the control points, whereas interpolated passes through the control points. And that's it. Uh, okay, thanks. Bye.